I'm going to talk through Whistle and I'll Come to You by Susan Hill. It's an extract from the novel The Woman in Black. Um, this is in preparation for your Edexcel IGCSE English Language Exam Paper 2. As always, I recommend that you read through this extract at least twice and give, you an oppo- give yourself an opportunity to write your own thoughts first before you listen to mine or anyone else's. Uh, it's really important you enter your exam with original ideas. Um, I'm not going to read through this extract line by line because that will take forever and a day Um, but I've really just tried to highlight what I think are of most use to you walking into your exam. I certainly haven't covered everything. Firstly, thinking about the title that's been given to this extract, it's important to note that this hasn't been given by Susan Hill. It's not the title of the chapter, for instance. Um, But I think it highlights the core theme in this extract. So it's an allusion to a short story um, called Whistle and I'll Come to You Lad by M.R. James, written in the early 1900s. And uh, within that short story we watch a character who is scientifically minded being thrown into this paranormal situation which really encourages him to question his core belief system that being of of being rational of of being logical and we certainly see that parallel with Arthur Kipps um, someone who thinks he has a good grasp on reality and his experiences within Eel Marsh House um, really challenges those core beliefs as well for him. So let's have a look. At the beginning, we certainly see right uh, right from the start the use of pathetic fallacy, and we'll see this all the way through the extract. Um, so you might say that um, to create that sense of fear and dread, um, Hill has employed gothic tropes such as it being set in an old house, the stormy weather, and the fact that um, Arthur Kipps is very isolated. Um, and you've got to always think about the intention of that, and I think the intention behind employing those tropes is really um, to create that ominous feel in this extract. So what you'll notice is as the storm intensifies and it continues to do so right to the end of the um, the extract, so does our fear, so does Arthur Kipp's fear. Um, looking at the way the house is described using the simile a ship at sea um this highlights the isolation of the house thinking about how isolated a ship looks in the middle of the sea um but also the vulnerability of the house and therefore arthur kipps as well thinking again if you imagine a ship at sea in the middle of a storm so it really just emphasizes this sense of vulnerability and the whole point is to make us feel uncomfortable and to and really to create also a sense of endangerment which is also um, a part of kind of a a gothic element of this extract. Look at the violent verbs used, battered, roaring as well as the plosive sounds uh, created by the buh. Again this adds to the sense of endangerment. Um, We also have a sense of insecurity with the rattling of the windows but you might even go further and say that the rattling of the windows mirrors our nervousness and mirrors Arthur Kipp's nervousness as well. Um, And then you've got the stereotypical ghostly sounds of the moaning and the whistling and that just again adds to this sense of dread. Now look at Arthur Kipps and how he is uh, presented at the beginning of the extract. This is important because we will see a character change. Um, So he gathers his wits, he reflects. So we can see straight away that he's this rational thinker. He's trying to maintain control in this situation. He says it was unlikely to blow away tonight because he's thought about all the facts, okay? The fact that this house has been here for so long. Um, So he's, he's... if you look at the word unlikely, he's dealing in probability here, pro- probability. So he's being quite mathematical with the situation. And again, that helps him at this point maintain control. The other thing that helps him um, deal with this situation is that he kind of reverts back to, to his childhood. So he starts through the use of a flashback, a structural technique. And he starts to think about his childhood and how safe he felt in his family home. And the um, sibilance here, snug safety, draws our attention um, to that sense of comfort, that sense of security. But it also um, draws our attention to the contrast of the safety of his childhood to the vulnerability of the present time, him being in Eel Marsh House. Um, 
We've got the predatory language off um, the wind, rage round like a lion, howling, beating. You've also got alliteration here to draw your attention again to this sense of endangerment. Um, and I would say one thing, even though there's a sense of comfort with this flashback, um, he is trance-like. Um, so that does suggest a lack of control already. Maybe that foreshadows the fact that he is actually going to lose control even more so over his mind as the extract develops. Um, and again, even though he feels, he feels comfort in thinking back to being a child, it actually accentuates the present danger, which we will see when he's snapped back into reality. Then from somewhere out of that howling darkness, a cry came to my ears. Um, so the non-specific noun, which is used all the way through, somewhere, somewhat, it, um, creates a sense of mystery and that, hel uh, that really encourages us to feel a sense of discomfort um, because we don't quite understand the situation. We don't know what's out there. Um, look at the zoomorphism. Again, this sounds quite predatory, the howling darkness. And again, that makes us feel that Arthur Kipps is under attack. Um, we've got electrical field of pain and suffering through the repetition of cry and the desperation and anguish. So this just emphasizes this sense that there is pain and suffering. And is that what awaits Arthur Kipps as well? So we feel quite nervous for his safety. Um, and we already talked about him trying to really be in control in this situation. We start to see that change through the passive voice where he says he's catapulted back into the present. Um, so he's starting to lose a bit more control, even though he's trying to maintain a sense of calm. Look at the shorter minor sentences that help build tension and anticipation at this time. I listened hard, nothing. Um, and he refers to the wind through the simile saying it's like a banshee. This is an allusion to folklore. Hearing a banshee would be a bad omen and that helps create a sense of foreboding again. And we continue to hear the aggressiveness, the violence of the wind, the banging and the rattling of the windows and continue, continuing to hear the cry as well of what we think by the end is a spirit. Um, look at how he, again, he continues to try and keep um, control. Okay, we've got the declarative sentence contrasting with the questions. There was no child. I knew that. So that's his rational side. But look what it juxtaposed with. How could there be? Yet how could I lie here and ignore even the crying of some long dead ghost? So the questions there suggest that actually um, his his rationality is being challenged at this moment and he's really battling with logic. This is kind of an internal battle that we're um, we are privy to and then again the fact that he has these facts there was no child I knew that but then he also in dialogue says rest in peace so that contradicts what he's previously declared that there is no child because now he's speaking to that spirit um, so there's definitely a sense of confusion here um, look at the repetition of trying here again uh, again he is trying to maintain control and the repetition of trying shows that that's not easy it is a big struggle and again this core belief system that he has of rationality of logical thinking is really being challenged um, he also starts to think about this calling voice and how long they've been in pain and the ellipsis here stresses the extent of their suffering and potentially heightens our fear as well because this is a spirit that has suffered for a very long time and therefore that kind of um, intensifies their anguish. Um, we have a sense of comfort through the dog as well. The dog follows him. He's, he's a form of companion. Um, or companionship, sorry, for Arthur Kipps. You could go a bit further. I haven't written that uh, on here and say that dogs are known to have kind of this sixth sense. So the fact that the dog keeps really close by, does that suggest the dog also feels nervous and senses something? So does that, again, add to our sense of nervousness? So that's another way of looking at it as well. Um, we have continued non-specific nouns. So this continued theme of mystery. 
Um, but look how his language is starting to change as well. He says, I had the impression, and later he says, I had simply the absolutely certain sense. This language really links to feelings and unconscious thought rather than logic. Before he was dealing in facts, now he's starting to think about the impressions he has, the senses he has. So he's becoming a bit more emotional. Um, when the lights go out, of course, that leaves him completely vulnerable. And that the darkness is a symbol of the unknown and, of, of course, like any good ghost story, creates a sense of fear and dread because he now has no idea, literally, of what's around him. But also, metaphorically, he doesn't really understand anything that's around him, or at least that's the way he's starting to feel. Um, the listing here, again, we start to see how a rational man's mind works. So he goes through a number of things that could discount there being anything there. I'd seen nothing, I felt nothing, there was no movement, no brush of a sleeve, no disturbance, and so on. So he is really, again, trying to go through all the facts like a rational man. So this is kind of the listing of facts. Um, but this obviously is juxtaposed with the emotional language here, language based on a feeling of unconscious thought, uh, non-specific nouns, the sense of the unknown, um, as well as the fact that we also start to get now this feeling of entrapment and claustrophobia because he's in this short, narrow corridor. And the adverb here inexplicably definitely challenges core, Kip's core belief. As a rational thinker, he'll believe everything has an explanation or can be explained away. He's finding that really difficult when he's just seen the door of the nursery open that had been locked previously. So he starts to think, he's starting to try and evaluate the situation but all that happens is he comes up with wild incoherent fantasies so it seems absolutely impossible for him to explain this away the rhetorical questions in this paragraph as well show that confusion nothing makes sense and it, he's really trying to explain something but everything just seems really quite beyond um, his understanding Look at the short sentence, which, which I would say at this point indicates he's kind of given up trying to rationalise. You might even say that this is a turning point um, in the extract, but then they see. So he's really, he's stopped trying to desperately find a rational explanation. Um, he goes back to declaratives. There was no living occupant of Eel Mar Marsh House other than myself and Samuel Daly's dog. So we've got, he's st trying to stick to tangible facts, but look, whatever, whoever, whoever again. So we've got those non-specific nouns. He is really questioning what is real now, okay? But what was real? So everything he's understood about the world, everything that he's believed in is being challenged. So he tries to look for a light, a symbol of truth. So he's he's a rational man. He's trying to look for answers. Um, but of course, again, like a very traditional, stereotypical ghost story, the light breaks, so there's no light, the torch um, isn't working. Those short sentences create a sense of disappointment and hopelessness, and they symbolise the fact that he cannot grasp the truth. He cannot understand, potentially, this other world, um, this other realm that he has no knowledge of or no uh, prior knowledge to or, or no experience of until this moment. Um, look at this highly emotive state which has contrasted with the level-headedness that we saw at the beginning when he really tried to explain everything logically, weeping tears of despair and fear, frustration and tension. Um, the violent verbs show a complete loss of control. This is a moment of hysteria. I drummed my fists upon the floorboards in a burst of violent rage until they throbbed. Absolute contrast. He has completely lost control. You might say he's the antithesis of the man he was at the beginning of the extract, searching for these logical explanations and sticking to tangible facts. Um, and we have again, thankfully, the dog that gives him a sense of calm I might argue this is 
ominous calm though and um, remember this isn't the end of a chapter or the end of the story it's just the end of the extract we don't know what's to come and I would be nervous at this point reading this for the first time well what's going to happen and the reason why I'd be nervous is because it doesn't end with complete calm we still have the the relentlessness of the wind and the crying look at the repetition here and again and again I heard the child's terrible cry so the relentlessness of the ghost's cry we end with that sense of entrapment. This is not going to end for poor Arthur Kipps. It's not something that he can explain away, and it's certainly something that he hasn't been able to escape. As always, I'd love to hear your own thoughts. Um, I haven't gone through absolutely everything. I've just tried to think about the main things, um, but I do love to, to read everyone else's interpretation, so feel free to leave a comment.